Hello and welcome to NARC Live on Wednesday the 1st of June 2022. Coming to you live from Norfolk on the east coast of England with Tammy MQ 0TC. Yep, hello. And me, David GQ 7URP on the show tonight. We find out more about the QDX digital transceiver and meet the man behind QRP Labs. Find out how you can use a special Jubilee prefix on your call sign from today. And we find out what on earth this is or was or is. But first, you may have noticed we used a slightly different call sign. And of course, you may already be on this because from today, the June the 1st, for the rest of this month, if you're a UK radio amateur, you can easily apply to get to add this Q as a prefix on your call sign. And that's whether you're an M or a G or a 2. So it goes straight after one of those, M or a G or a Q. Uh, sorry, or a 2. And this is the way you do it. So Tammy's now going to put up a slide. This is one of um, the RSGB's social media. They're managing this, but you don't have to be an RSGB member to do this. But this is something that they have organised as part of their Jubilee celebrations. It's a notice of variation, an NOV, and it's really easy. Don't be afraid that this is going to be really complicated to do because this is all you do. Go to that link. Make a note of that link now, rsgb.org forward slash Jubilee. And then we'll show you what you'll get. You'll just need to have your license number to hand. There's a special reference number. We're going to show you this page now. And then you will be sent this within seconds automatically as an email. You'll be able to download this and print it out. And that's for the rest of this month. I mean, I have taken off my license reference on there uh, just in case um, because this does go out publicly. But you can see the sort of details. It's between the 1st of June and the 30th of June. And you'll be able to use this Q prefix. And I'm sure, although it may or may not mean as much to you in this country, I think you'll find that working overseas countries, it would mean quite a lot. So if you're out, out to try and improve your, um, uh, you know, improve your scores and everything else overseas, I just had a shock because I didn't know that was going to happen. Very patriotic, Tammy. Um, then that's as easy as all you need to do. So it's rsgb.org forward slash jubilee. Why don't you do it now? Just get that license. You'll need the reference number from your license and you'll get the NOV within seconds. I'm in party mode, you see. Obviously. I can't see anything, but I'm in party are you, mode. Are you drinking in party mode or have you just got a boring old um, soft drink again? No, I've just got a boring old soft so drink. I'll crack out the hard stuff later, shall I? <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, so um, let's. Um, while we're talking about the jubilee, one of our members, Kevin, M0UJD, Tammy's brother, my mate, um, he had decided that he was going to make his own beacon for the Jubilee. Now, I will stress at this point, before we show you how he's done this, it's a proper light lit beacon. This is not something you should just try at home yourself without expert knowledge or experience. Kevin actually got professional advice because he is an electrician, not a gas worker, but he works with people who do this and, and he took a lot of advice before he did this. So that's just a, a serious warning now for what we're about to show you. This isn't to be tried without going through lots of tech checks and, and getting lots of advice. So let's show you some of the pictures now. So what we're trying to do first is make the burner. Now being an electrician, Kevin has used conduit boxes. So you'll notice those things there are standard sort of uh, electrical conduits. There's a central box and there's a four steel, galvanized steel things coming out the air. There's, there's stoppers in the end. I don't know what all the terms are, I'm afraid. I was there when he was doing this. In fact, I think that's my hand holding that there. Um, now, although you see Teflon tape brand there, he's actually used a very high temperature special silicone, the sort of thing you use on boilers and things like that to seal them, as well as that PTFE tape. So don't just think that's enough. And of course, because one of these boxes is not normally gas tight or airtight. Then you can see a sort of cable entry oh, at the sorry, beginning. I'm That's sorry, all right, Tammy. That's okay, okay that. there. You can just see a sort of cable pipe entry there. Now, just look underneath that before we go to the next picture, because what you'll notice there, if you if you can imagine, that's the bottom of a steel pail, and that's what is used for the main beacon. So, if we go to the next picture, you can see that uh, Kevin's got that main pail, and he's, he's using an angle grinder there. Again, be very careful if you're going to do something like this to take the rim off this galvanized pail. Next, 
that's Tammy's hands there. She has got a cardboard template to sort of make some petal shapes on the top of this pail. So the top part of there, the bottom, top right, you'll see is the bit that's been angle grinded off. So obviously not without, you know, again, I can't stress enough how this is not the sort of thing to play with, but that's, they're very sharp edges there. So be very careful. And then we used some good old strong tin snips to cut away because once you, you took away the rim, it was actually quite a thin material, quite, quite thin steel to cut this. You can see the sort of shape that we were cutting there. And that's what you end up looking like. Now, I think you'll agree that doesn't really look like a, a boring old metal pail anymore. Next stage is to fit all this stuff in. And I think that's uh, drilling, drilling the holes in the sides to holes. give a bit of decoration. Yeah. That's Kevin's dad on the left. M6 MSC. That's right. Yeah. And here's the moment of truth. And here's the moment of truth. So have a look at this. Yeah, I could smell. I felt the heat as well. <laughs> now, there's lots it's very of. Reliable, isn't it? But doesn't that look wonderful? Honestly, I know, you know, he's our family, but I really do think that is a wonderful thing. And it looks better than I think you could imagine if I just told you that he used a steel pail to make this beacon. So, well done okay, to Kevin. Oh, there's another picture here, slightly darker at night, is it? Yep. Oh, just, yeah. That it's was brilliant. a storm cloud. <laughs> right, okay. Anyway, well done, Kevin. It really does look good, and I'm sure it's going to be good in your private sort of party. Obviously, it's not the sort of thing that you'd want to use in public anyway. And I must stress again, be very, very careful. Don't just do this unless you get some expert advice, as he did from gas professionals in particular, to do that. But it does look rather good, I think. So thanks for sharing that with us. That's our Jubilee special. Yep, yeah, I had to take my glass off so I couldn't see. Yeah. <laughs> that will help then, all right. So now, next to tell you um, about Orsted. Now you may remember that I think it was the beginning of last year, we had a talk from Orsted about their offshore wind farm that they were hoping to get permission to, to run. And why would they come and give a talk like that to radio amateurs? Well, particularly the substation that's inland is gonna convert the AC or DC, because they weren't sure um, at that time, into uh, the manageable mains that we all know and love, the 50 hertz, 250 volts effectively, or 230 volts nowadays at your, at your house. And of course, where that substation, because you can imagine that's gonna be dealing with mega, mega watts, and it could cause interference. And that's why they came and gave us that talk. And they did promise us that when it came round to, if they got the permission and they started to plan that substation, they would talk to us again. Now, to be honest, it was off my radar. I'd forgotten about it largely. Uh, and Roger G3LDI as well, who, who actually booked that talk in originally. But out of the blue, a few days ago, Roger and I got an email letter from them to say that they, they were now proceeding because they have got the planning permission and they're now going to start working on this substation. And they would love to hear from radio amateurs in particular who are about four, within four kilometres of the substation, which is around about Swordston. I've actually asked them for the exact location, but it's near Swordston. So if you are a radio amateur within about four kilometres of Swordston and you care about this and you want to have a, your say with them about the sort of interference that potentially could come from this massive inverter effectively, that's either gonna be upping a voltage or down, downing a voltage, depending on, on what technology they use, then get in touch with us, the usual address, radio at dcpmicro.com, and we'll add you to the list. I've also contacted the RSGB's EMC committee for some advice and guidance from them, so hopefully they'll give us some help as well. But I really did think uh, that it was a, a good shout from Austin to actually contact us after, you know, it may be actually two years. Do you remember your better at time than I. I mean, the, the last uh, no, two years uh, it was has only been strange. Last year, I think, wasn't okay, it? and it was done online. Yeah. So if you're within four kilometers or so of Swordston and you think you might be affected by this and you want to have your say, or at least say that you're one of the people who might be affected, then drop us a line to the usual email address and we'll, we'll go from there. And we'll keep everybody else, of course, in touch with what happens. Now, a few, a couple of Sundays ago was the Dunstable Downs Rally, or otherwise known as the Luton Radio Rally. And one of NARC's long-standing members was Chris G4 ILR, and he moved to Dunstable to be nearer his family a few years ago. Well, uh, I was with uh, Kevin, uh, M0UJD, and James, 
FG7 PQF and we decided to go and pay a very quick visit to Chris and surprise him and we took a picture of him and his wife Judy and here they are in their garden. I think you'll agree that Chris doesn't seem to have changed at all. No, I, think, I don't think he has. You know, and you, no. it's what, someone, he used to live near Coltershaw and he moved there say about five years ago I think now to be near a family but we said we'd show them their picture this evening so it's lovely to see them. Now we have since Springview this year we have been keeping you in touch with a certain garden in South Norfolk uh, something that I've actually called now Ham Nest. Ham Nest. <laughs> you hadn't seen that on the script, had you? No, so I've called it Ham Nest instead of Ham Fest. Um, and uh, we've got the latest video. Maybe this is going to be the last this one even for last, a while, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Because of, well, it'll become obvious what it is. So this is from Lynn and James M0 UKS. Thanks for sending us this. lovely to see him go in it well yeah i guess mixed feelings i think he's sid the squatters oh, sid the squatters is yeah, it oh look at that his, or her little ones pheasant there as well i, don't, I, <laughs> I think don't, i'd be scared to go out with that's the not a surrogate there. parent is it <laughs> oh look an empty nest oh. oh now this one this i think there was nine in here wasn't there I believe. This is the 24th of the 5th, this is so blue. just a week ago. Oh. Look at them. Is this the first flight? Uh, how do they know how to fly? It's weird, isn't I, it? Yeah, incredible, isn't it? Oh, look, they've been fed before he goes. I'm trying to encourage them to come out. There's more food out here. <laughs> sure he looks like he's all in the itch now. Oh, oh there you go. look. <laughs> oh, and then there was none. Oh, oh. but nine more words, words in the world. Yeah. What can we say? Lynn and James M0 UKS, thank you ever so much for sharing that with us. I'm sure we've all been intrigued to see that go from those early days of CCTV, because you've used some modified CCTV cameras in those boxes in your garden, and it's been lovely to see them. Thank you very much for sharing them. We're almost there. Um, now, just to tell you though, that I've heard from Steve G3VA, and if you watch Have I Got News For You, then you'll probably know what I'm gonna talk, be talking about here, because a few weeks ago, probably about a month ago in fact, we said that they did feature something on there, but uh, uh, to do with amateur radio, maybe not as most positive thing. <laughs> but Steve has said that on the Friday before last edition, they featured it again. And this, look at this, Keynote. This was from the Keynote magazine, and the key is in Morse key, was what they featured in the program. <laughs> if you want to see what they said about it, and hopefully, hopefully it was complimentary for our hobby, then have a look at Have I Got News For You on the BBC iPlayer from two weeks ago. And just to tell you as well quickly that, before we go to Tammy's Little People, that um, We've updated the Norfolk Amateur Radio Club website. Well, I say we, it's a royal we really. That's Mark M's uh, uh, G0LGJ, who's our webmaster. He's made a few improvements. So if you haven't looked at it in the last few days, you'll, you'll see that at the top of the picture, we've got uh, at the top of the uh, homepage, we've got some pictures of the special events that we've got coming out in the summer, special events with a small S really, because we've got things like Barford, Radio by the Seaside, and Wheating already on there. And also, We've got uh, the meetings for NARC on the left-hand side of that whole uh, sort of um, home page. So if you're not sure whether we're having this NARC live on, online or whether we're going to meet at, for real at the school, then have a look on that left-hand side of the, the, of the website at any time and you should see what we're doing and, and be knowing whether we're actually meeting for real or meeting online. And one other little thing I'm just going to put in, I hadn't mentioned to Tammy that I was going to talk about this, We've had some email issues here today. We've got our own email server and it did, which is very unusual, it did a complete reboot at about 2.30 this afternoon. Didn't know why, except that I got hundreds of emails uh, in that I'd already had once before. So, I, by the way, if I have missed anything from any of you, I apologise for that in advance. Um, but also then, when I put my other computer on here in the office, um, I did find as well that um, there was three antivirus updates 
uh, from Trojan threats today. Now, the only reason I'm sharing this with you is it might be quite serious. It's first of a month. So if you have an antivirus subscription, why not go and check that it's up to date just in case this is something that could be quite serious? Because it's very, very rare that our server does this in the middle of a day. It normally does it sort of in the early hours of the morning. So just, just a word of uh, advice there anyway. Enough from me. Over to Cool Jubilee. Tammy is not wearing her glasses anymore to, to show us her little people for this week. I've got a couple of pictures. That oh, have you? Oh, of course. Oh, I'm going to talk about them a little bit later. Can we oh, do that? Okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's Fair a bit enough. later. You didn't see the memo, did you? No. Let's have a look at your little Here's people. little people. Well, I thought we hadn't had a train for a few weeks, so this is a bread train. Oh, that is good, isn't it? It does look like a little train, doesn't it, with the, uh, it does. With the humps in there. It's really good. Our guest just, is, uh, uh, Hans Summers is just watching this now, and I know he has a lot of close connections in Japan. And this is a Japanese website called miniature-calendar.com. So we feature one of these pictures every week that Tammy chooses, and that's this one. Thank you very much, Tammy. It makes me feel hungry now as well. Yeah. So what have you been doing? As you can see, although we're not meeting every week now online, we, we do love to get your pictures and your stories and your videos and everything else to do with it. It keeps us all in touch with each other. Now let's have a look at that competition that we ran last time before we come to our guest tonight. And this is our competition which we call What on Earth is This? Now this didn't get as many responses but you've had a two weeks to do this, not one. And they do vary a little bit. So I'll read out the answers. The, sorry, the... Uh, the, uh, the um, I'll go first this questions. week. Yeah, okay. Uh, Steve G3EVA, is this week's What on Earth Is It? Is an ant's nest. Okay. Could be. Uh, Bob GSU says, this looks like a slice of bread and butter pudding. I suppose it does. A bit, bit overdone, maybe, but yeah, <laughs> okay. Bob G6PWS looks like a home aquarium ant's nest or just an ant's nest or wasps or bugs nest. Ralph 2M0RHT says this week has nothing to do with earth. Rather having enlarged the photo, it's possibly the larva of some sort of grub, bee or other flying insect. Or if not, then it's a brown blob of earth. Other <laughs> brown blobs are available in most good stores, he says. <laughs> Nev M0NFY, is this a very close up image of a PCB track? part way through etching i'd like it to be that i'd mm. like it to be that we'll see in a minute and john g0mxn was honest and says i'm baffled the nearest i can get is something infested with insect larvae that people would would not see as a must-have item otherwise it looks organic he says well that's, think about that when we reveal what it is uh, anybody online uh, by the way no, no nobody's entered it online tonight, no. so here we go this is what it is it's a piece of wood. It's an end grain of oak. Now I did it. I did say that it was enlarged before. We didn't say how much, and um, we did say though on the pictures that we put on there that it was an enlarged picture. But look at that to, to give you an idea. That if you can't see it, depending on what you're watching this on, it's two millimeters. That little black line. That's only two millimeters of it. So it's quite well enlarged there. There's early wood at the top, and medullary rays at the bottom. Thank you very much to Peter Williams. Our Bright Sparks, come on, the, the chap who used to help John with uh, Bright Sparks every week, he sent that in to us a few weeks ago. So let's have a look at the new competition question. This is going to last three weeks now because we're not back with Night Live for three weeks. What on earth is this? Any ideas? Have a look, there's quite a few clues there, but it's something very specific. And the only clue I'm going to give you a No, from, no, no, don't give well, a clue. Well, just to say... No, no, don't give a clue. That they could be using that sort of thing in the next few days, no? No. Isn't that all right to say that? No. All right, I won't say it. <laughs> Send your answers to radio at dcpmicro.com by two weeks. Uh, sorry, actually three weeks today by three o'clock. And we'll see if you're right, if you know what on earth that is. We'll be putting it on the website and on social media and everything as well in the next few days. So just to tell you what's coming up this week at NARC before we go over to our guest. On Sunday, it's the GB2RS News on GB3MB at 7 o'clock. On Monday, the Monday Night Net on also on GB3MB at 7.30. And at 8.30, the 80 meter CW Net on 3.543 megahertz. And then next Wednesday, the 8th of June, it's another meeting for real at the CNS. 
It's a social informal, but there's also an informal roundtable discussion on nano VNAs. Whether you know how to use one or not, bring yours. So if you've got one, but you haven't got a clue how to use it, and quite a few of you have, I believe, from when we had the talk a few weeks ago, we've certainly got at least one or two people there who do know what they're doing with it. Stuart is one who suggested this. So take them along. You'll learn how to maybe get more from it and share with others. It's, a, it's not a talk. It's a social informal. You can join, even if you're thinking of buying one, actually, and you haven't got one, you'll be able to join that discussion. That's next week for real at the CNS school where we meet between seven and nine. And I guess they'll be starting that sort of very informal roundtable discussion about 7.30. And just to actually, if I may, preview the week after is the 15th of June. And this is a tabletop sale. So this is two weeks today. And that's a tabletop sale. It's absolutely free for all members. And if you've not joined yet, you can join for the rest of the year for just a fiver. That's a bargain, isn't it? If you've got something to sell or you want to buy some bits and pieces, you might see them there before Barford. Snap up a bargain. Uh, and we really are nearly ready for our guests. We're a little bit later than we said. Just to remind you, apart from keeping in touch with us about what you've been doing, uh, don't forget we have this NARC card, which we send to anybody that you think who can be cheered up, celebrating a, an anniversary. Uh, maybe they're not well or something like that. Uh, we're very happy to send this card to them. It's our card. We'll add your name to ours, sign it, and send it off to anyone anywhere in the world. Just radio at dcpmicro.com. Let us know. I have just quickly got two pictures which you've still forgotten about. Oh, I have because we were meant to do that over the... I'm very sorry. Winding back a little bit, when I talked <laughs> about the meetings at CNS, these are two pictures that John Tui Zero TWQ showed us. Oh, he's looking very serious there, but I think it was quite Maybe a joyous affair. Maybe it's when you're doing your notices. There's quite, this is quite a large room. I know some of you are still a little concerned, and that's absolutely fine, and we fully respect that you may not be ready to come to meetings and things, but the windows are open. As you can see from that room, we had a sort of meeting up this end and a meeting there, but everybody can be quite socially distanced. It's a big common room. There was about 35 people that night. So just to give you some idea. All right. Thank you very much for the pictures, John. So now on to our main event. Now, a few years ago, before we did any of this, before any of the pandemic, before we did this, we used to do some Skype talks with people. And one of the people that we had come to talk to us was our next guest, Hans Summers G0 UPL. Now, he was talking to us then mainly about his QRP Labs company's product, the QCX, which has been an incredible success. But now he's brought a new model out called the QDX, which is a digital version of that. And I'm really pleased to say that Hans is with us now live from his home in Turkey, where it's three hours later, I believe. Hello, Hans. Hello, Dave. Thank you. Um, yes, we're two hours later, actually. Oh, we're two three hours. hours ahead of, uh, three hours ahead of Greenwich Mean Time, so two hours ahead of British Summer Time. So it's not um, quite, it's nearly 10 o'clock there. Yeah, it's not too bad. I've not given right. talks to the, some clubs in the US and that's kind of involved in getting up in the middle of the night. <laughs> I bet it has. Not, not, not so much fun. Um, yeah, so I still am G0 UPL, even though I haven't lived in the UK for quite a few years, 2011 now. Um, spent some years in Japan, as you mentioned earlier, and now here in Turkey. And this talk about the QDX, which is really quite a different radio to the QCX, uh, it's a completely different design, um, not just a digital version of it, has really been very popular since launch in October last year. And this is a talk I gave a couple of weeks ago at FDIM, the four days in May QRP conference that goes along with the Dayton Hamvention in Dayton, Ohio. So um, it's pretty much the same talk, although... I just make it up as I go along rather than have a script that I read, so I'm sure it'll be quite different. And this is about the design of the QDX, so quite a technical um, presentation, really. Okay, well, before so, you do start, Hans, just a <clears throat> reminder to everybody at home, in case you don't watch these regularly, that you can ask questions at any time during this talk if you put them down onto BATC or on Facebook, and we'll read them to Hans at the end. But now back to Hans to find out more about the QDX. Thank you. So firstly, what is a digital mode and the designs and goals? These are the five things I'm going to split the talk up into. Um, what is the QDX and the technical part? How, how is the design and why is it like that? And then some discussion about the challenges that we have of producing anything at the moment. So firstly, what is a digital mode? And 
Morse code is a digital mode, the oldest digital mode, if you like, ones and zeros, which could be key downs or key ups, or if you prefer dits and dars. But normally we think of a digital mode as something involving a computer to do the encoding and the decoding. And there are various different ways of encoding digital transmissions uh, using on-off keying, uh, such as Morse code is on-off keying, frequency shift keying, so RITI is an example, and a very old digital mode, an example of frequency shift keying, phase shift keying, uh, PSK31, for example, or more modern modes using spread spectrum techniques. And the typical digital mode will be sending text messages, for example, chat modes like PSK31 or RITI. Uh, there are computer QSOs, such as the FT8 mode. Some digital modes send pictures, or it can just be the propagation testing uh, beacon, such as Whisper. By the way, earlier when you were talking about the beacon uh, for the Jubilee, I first thought you were going to be talking about a radio beacon, so I was quite <laughs> surprised. To... <laughs> anyway. Um, then there's some sometimes balloon te telemetry, such as our new uh, U4B balloon tracker. That's another example of things that you can do with a digital mode. Now, it should be remembered, you know, I was presenting this at FDIM, which is a QRP convention, and this is a QRP transceiver. Um, often digital modes are a very, have a very narrow bandwidth, and narrow bandwidth improves the signal to noise ratio at the expense of speed so it's kind of perfect for qrp fanatics because it allows you to cover very great distances with a very low power level but it may also be interesting to note that uh, often people with a more compromised antenna situation uh, could also be uh, uh, very well suited for this um, it's not necessarily low power. Weak signal modes are not necessarily the same as low power modes, and this is a debate that crops up occasionally. For example, EME, moon bounce, is a, a weak signal mode, but certainly is not low power. Most people are using a, a high power to, to affect that path. Digital modes may or na may not include error correction. So RITI is an example of one that does not have any error correction, but um, many modern modes include some error correction to improve the uh, data transfer. So this is a typical setup and uh, my uh, hand drawing there using a rather old computer on the left. <laughs> so um, the computer generates and encodes the audio and then sends that to an SSB rig that transmits and receives the audio. And then the SSB uh, rig produces audio in the, on the receive and sends that to the computer which then decodes it. Now, this is the way that it's always been, and this, this is a, a very interesting uh, aspect. Digital mode software running on the PC, so the most popular at the moment is WSJTX, and the most popular mode is FT8, which has been around for a couple of years now, but has really, really taken off, and, and uh, by far the most popular digital mode now on air, and perhaps even competing with Morse code and sideband contacts. It also does a variety of other modes, FT4, JT9, JT65, and, and others. Um, then there's JS8 call, which is a kind of spin-off from FT8 using the same protocol as FT8, but packaged up into a conversational uh, program where you can chat, uh, so just typing in your text and have it appear on the uh, file station screen. There's FLDG, which is a much older piece of software that does CW, PSK31, RITI, Hellschreiber, and more. But they all have in common that they send and receive audio tones to and from a sound card that then passes that audio along to a uh, SSB transceiver. However, this is not the only way to generate a digital signal. And uh, this is very key to the whole uh, concept of QDX as a transceiver, as a kit, as a low cost, high performance kit. So consider two ways of generating CW. Uh, there's a very simple way using a crystal controlled oscillator and a power amplifier. This would be a typical homebrew project you might see in Sprat, for example. Or there's, you could do it with an audio tone generator connected to an SSB transmitter. And the two, assuming the SSB transmitter is perfect, the two generated signals would be absolutely identical and indistinguishable. And this is something that some people grapple with, but it is in fact reality. If you give an audio tone to an SSB transmitter, you will get a single 
carrier come out, which would be exactly the same carrier that you would have generated from a crystal oscillator with an amplifier attached to it. The details are, however, that no SSB transmitter is in fact perfect, and you have some residual carrier left over, as well as some unwanted sideband uh, on the opposite sideband, because uh, usually they don't have a perfect unwanted sideband cancellation. So in this case, in the example I've sketched out here, I'm considering a 40 meter crystal control transmitter on 7030, and it would be, produce exactly the same output as a sideband transmitter whose oscillator is tuned to 7029.3 and is fed a 700 hertz tone. And it's exactly the same with digital. And most, mostly, as I said, we're using audio for our an SSB transceiver, but you can also generate it directly in the same way that you would with a, a crystal oscillator and power amplifier. So in this case, uh, and this is exactly what QDX does, and I'll explain why it's so important to do it this way. And in this case, I've got the example of the USB dial frequency being 7074 kilohertz and applying a 1700 audio tone generated, for example, by WSJTX. This is the FT8 frequency, and that would produce a 7075.7 kilohertz transmit frequency, the actual carrier that's being transmitted. And this is very important um, because this is exactly what QDX does, and I'll explain why that's so important in a moment. So now on to some of the motivations for why I did this, uh, this kit. Going back to 2019, late 2019, there were several FT8 kits around. Um, this one pictured is not actually a digital transceiver, but it's one by CR Kits, a Chinese company. I chose this picture because I didn't want to offend any of the Americans in the room uh, at FDIM because the other FT8 kits which I was referring to were actually American kits. And uh, as I mentioned then and there, I had to somehow survive through to the Monday without being murdered before I, before <laughs> I left the building. So um, the several FT8 kits were around at the end of 2009, and they all used direct conversion transmitters and receivers with quite poor performance, both on receive and transmit. And not just low power levels, but pretty much lower power levels than were even necessary. Because being direct conversion, they were actually generating both sidebands at the same time, the upper and the lower sidebands. So they were wasting half the power on the unwanted sideband, as well as generating QRM potentially for any stations operating there. And they were crystal controlled and single band uh, trans transceivers uh, crystal controlled meaning that then they were locked on the FT8 frequency, for example. So if you wanted to try JS8, you would, wouldn't have any chance of that. And for what they were, I looked at them and didn't even think they were particularly low cost at the time. Now, I should say that uh, many of these kits have actually seen some improvements over the last couple of years. And uh, one of them is now doing a sideband transmit. Uh, so they've eliminated that problem of wasting half the power on the unwanted sideband um, and all the trouble that comes with QRM from that. They're using the SI5351A synthesizer to produce the uh, frequency so that therefore they can uh, be frequency agile and operate on more than one frequency. So there have been some recent improvements, but back at 2019, when I looked at this, I was quite disappointed by what I saw and I, it kind of motiv motivated me to want to do something better. So my goals with the project were to create something with a very high performance, uh, very high performance Digimos transceiver that would operate on multiple bands rather than a single band and give the full five watts, which is generally agreed to be the, the uh, definition of QRP and at the same time be low cost. So I wanted to basically deliver much higher performance and many more features, but without increasing the cost compared to the other kits that were around at the time. Now, it actually took me quite a lot longer than I had hoped. Um, of course, we had the pandemic in the meantime, and the kids were off school, and I was doing Zoom classes, trying to set up their Zoom connections to school and deal with dropped connections, computers running out of charge, and all of this nonsense. We had a baby in the meantime as well in June 2020, and uh, I also did the uh, successors to the QCX kit, which were the QCX Plus and then the QCX Mini, uh, which basically offered the same radio, but in a different format, you know, improved, improved mechanical format. So I was busy on a lot of things. And in the end, I didn't finish the software for the QDX until uh, October 2021. 
when it first went on sale. So a quick description of what the radio is. And uh, Dave, I don't know if you can just sh let me see the, let people see the, my camera here. Yeah, sure. Uh, so we can have a, to you now. Yeah. have a picture of what we're looking at. And most people's reaction when they first see this is, wow, it's so small, right? Um, mm. Because, it, you know, it's, it's literally uh, that big. And when you see what's packed into it, you'll find that quite small. So we just have a single status LED on the front. And then on the rear on the rear panel, um, four connectors, which are on USB connector, the power DC power input, a BNC connector for the RF output input, and also a PTT for people who want more power. And inside, there's a single circuit board um, with toroids and some capacitors on top. These are the filters that determine the band of operation. Um, there's also a power amplifier here. And then on the bottom side, a bunch of um, SMD components, which are uh, all pre-mounted by the factory. So there's no need to do any SMD soldering. So that's what it looks like. Uh, Dave, let's go back to the slides, if I may. Um, and this covers 80 meters, 40 meters, 30 meters, and 20 meters on that one board uh, using pin diode switching. So there's no relays involved, uh, just diode switching. It also covers 60 meters. This was not something that was originally intended, but it has recently been tested by uh, one of the purchasers of the original kit and found to work very well with very good uh, performance and uh, good enough harmonic suppression as well on, on the uh, transmitter harmonics. Um, it can produce a full five watts, either from a nine volt power supply or a 12 volt power supply, dep depending on how you build it. So you add two turns to the output transformer if you want 12 volt supply and, and three turns if you want nine volt supply. It has a TCXO referenced SI535A synthesized local oscillator. So it can operate on any frequency in those bands as well as it's got extremely high frequency stability because of the TCXO reference. So there's no drifting involved at all. The receiver is actually implemented as a software defined receiver, an embedded software defined receiver, which means there's no additional PC processing required for the SDR. It's all done on the board with a 32-bit ARM processor chip. Um, there's a 24-bit ADC chip with 112 dB of dynamic range. So it's a very, very high performance uh, ADC chip. And it has one of the key features, a single signal transmit. So it's, there's no unwanted sideband whatsoever and no residual carrier whatsoever. Um, it also includes USB sound card and CAT control uh, all over the same USB cable, and it has built-in test and alignment tools. So there's quite a lot inside that small package. Here's a, a better look inside. Um, this is the Rev3 board, the latest board. Um, so you can see it's actually quite quick to put together because it's just the capacitors and, and the toroids to wind, and then it's all the transistors and the connectors. This is the bottom side. Um, please don't admire the soldering. This is the prototype, which I have soldered myself and uh, not terribly good at the uh, SMD components. But as I said, this is all factory done. So it's, uh, it's all ready. Uh, no SMD soldering to be done. And this is the front view with a single LED, the status LED, and the rear view with the four connectors. So now, some, some, now we get on to the main bulk section of the presentation about the technical design. So the QDX implements this USB connection, which is really like a four-way USB hub with a sound card connected and a serial port connected. So you know these uh, four-way USB hubs that you plug into your laptop if you want more USB connections, and it just allows you to plug in more USB devices. So that allows us to have a single cable between the QDX and the PC, which carries both the sound at 48,000 samples per second, 24-bit resolution, as well as a virtual serial port for CAT control. So CAT control is when the computer software controls all aspects of the radio transceiver over the serial connection. And it's important because it means that we can do away with any kind of controls on the radio at all, uh, just purely the, the connection to the computer. And so in WSJTX, if you change to a different band or change to a different mode, 
then it will send that message over the cat control connection to the radio, which will automatically then switch bands and, and modes and frequencies. The USB connection is also used as the for a firmware update procedure, which is extremely easy to do, and I'll come on to in a moment. So some advantages of having USB audio, and this is very important, the, the, there's an absolutely perfect sound transfer. It doesn't add any noise. It doesn't add any distortion. There's zero loss. Literally, whatever WSJTX generates, a sequence of numbers which represent the audio sine wave that it's simulating, we get exactly that same sequence of numbers in QDX with no change whatsoever. So there's no loss, no distortion, uh, uh, no hum, no possibility of audio pick up, hum pickup, um, and no audio cables that can come loose and, and uh, pick up noise, uh, needing different quality and so on. It's a, it's a very, very pure system. It's also impossible to overload the, uh, for example, if you have an SSB transceiver connected to your PC and you have the volume up too high, it's possible to overload that uh, SSB transceiver and produce splatter onto adjacent channels. Here we have no possibility of that. We just get the pure uh, audio directly from the PC. The serial, virtual comm serial, as I said, uh, produces, uh, allows the software on the PC to control uh, the frequency and the band that the radio is on, as well as when to transmit and receive. So some of the other kits at the time, 2019, when I designed this, were using voice-operated transmission box. And the disadvantage of that is that you've got uh, your computer and you've got loads of things running it on it. Like I use web, WhatsApp, or you might have Skype running. And what happens is the computer plays you some notification noise and then the radio transmits that on air, which puts the radio into transmit. And so that can be quite inconvenient and a much better way to, to handle the transition between transmit and receive is using cat to actually send a command to the radio to put it into transmit mode. And all of the Digimo software use CAP in this way to talk to the radio, both for switching it between transmit and receive, as well as for um, specifying the band and the frequency. And QDX pretends to be a Kenwood, uh, Kenwood TS480, which is just a, a very sort of lowest common denominator protocol that allows me to interface without having to contact the various software developers and beg them to include QDX as uh, with its own uh, protocol. There's also a terminal access, so you can connect a terminal to the QDX, the terminal emulator such as PuTTY, and use that for configuration and alignment and updating the firmware. So uh, now onto the update of the firmware. This this is a very nice, I'm very proud of this aspect of it because, um, you know, there's a lot of radio manufacturers who have various ways of doing the firmware update. You might need to install some software application on your PC um, and connect to the radio of a serial port and, and do the firmware update that way. Or for example, I've seen some ICOM radios where you have to put the firmware, onto a firmware update onto an SD card and then install it from the SD card. Now this, the method that I have here is that I, I have QDX appear on the PC as a USB flash drive. And you simply download the new firmware file from the QRP Labs website and unzip it and dra drag the firmware file across into the USB flash drive. And so it's unbelievably easy. And as soon as you drag it across, the QDX itself installs its new firmware version. Um, and you need no special hardware, so no programmer cards or anything like that, no special software to handle it, and no drivers. Works on any operating system, Windows, Linux, Macintosh, anything that can handle a USB flash drive can handle the firmware update on the QDX. Additionally, it's got 256-bit AES encryption, uh, which is a hugely heavy encryption, uh, so that, uh, that basically just protects the, the code from anybody copying it, which is the risk I'll come on to later as well. Now, this was the key concept that I was talking about earlier, the signal transmit strategy. Um, the PC Digimode software tells the QDX what the dial frequency should be via CAT. And this is what you would see on the, on the frequency display of a conventional SSB transceiver. The PC software then sends digital tones as audio tones to the radio, 
But instead of using an SSB modulator to modulate those into RF and transmit them, which is what a single sideband transceiver would do, what QDX actually does is measures this audio tone frequency that's coming from the PC and then add that to the USB dial frequency it's been told and then gets the synthesizer to produce that frequency directly and immediately. And then the power amplifier just transmits it. And this method has quite a, a few benefits, which I'm going to come on to. Um, so normally when you do a frequency measurement, you'll have a one second gate time and you'll count how many pulses there are in that one second. But uh, that's a much too slow met method of frequency measurement for these digital modes, which have tones which are transmitted for much shorter than one second. And so what we do, what we actually do here is a cycle period measurement, um, which is, it turns out to be one of those things which is much easier than you thought it was going to be, as well as much more accurate than you thought it was going to be. And um, so it's a very pleasant surprise when it all works out as nicely as, as, nicely as this, um, and something that doesn't happen very often. So what we get from the PC is 48,000 samples per second, and we already know that each of those samples is one 48,000th of a second apart, and we know that they're perfectly centered on zero, because the tone generation in the software uh, just generates audio perfectly centered on zero. And we look for a zero crossing. So we just look for one sample which is above zero, followed by another sample which is below zero. And we can get those two numbers and do a straight line linear interpolation to find the exact moment of the zero crossing. So what we're trying to measure is the, the exact moment before the negative uh, sample at which the line would have crossed zero on the way in. And at the other end of the cycle, uh, similarly, the exact additional time from the positive sample towards the zero, as you can see in this diagram. <coughs> and it turns out that you can use a straight line linear approximation, because if you remember from uh, your secondary school mathematics days, at small values of x, sine x is pretty much equal to x. And that's just another way of saying that at the point the sine wave crosses the zero axis, it's almost a straight line. And so it's extremely accurate at that point. And we do get some interesting features of this, which is that if you go to very, very high frequencies, audio frequencies, the number of samples uh, in each cycle is low. And therefore, you, you stray away from this accurate this accurate approximation this straight line linear approximation and the top graph there is a very much exaggerated uh, view of this where there are very few samples of each cycle and you can see that as at the zero crossing it becomes harder and harder to actually measure that accurately conversely at low frequencies such as the uh, one on the bottom right here uh, you get a very very accurate measurement but it turns out that for our purposes that so we want to cover up from from up to about uh, three or just over three kilohertz, um, the measurement is extremely accurate. And in fact, I would say astonishingly accurate. So a single cycle measurement here gives about 0 0.05 hertz um, of accuracy around the middle of the band, so around 1500 hertz. And the screenshot that I'm showing here is one of the tools that's available inside the terminal uh, applications uh, that I mentioned just now when you connect a terminal emulator such as PuTTY. And this actually scrolls up in much the same way as a waterfall might do on a, a, a color screen of a fancy SSB transceiver, um, showing the intensity of the signals coming in at different frequencies on horizontal axis. So it scrolls up and there are different rates of scrolling that you can use, which are set up to uh, be consistent with different digital modes. And this shows here an FT8 signal. So it shows how the uh, tones are actually being generated. And then at the top right hand corner, it shows the frequency that is being measured at that particular instant. It's further improved by averaging because we don't actually need to calculate at a single cycle level um, at 1500 Hertz. There's actually no point being able to measure the frequency in a single cycle and update the frequency of the transmission that quickly. So what I actually do in QDX is average that so that it actually measures 100 times per second. So it's averaging multiple cycles and getting 100 times per second measurement. And that brings the error down to less than 0 0.01 hertz, um, plus or minus 0 0.01 hertz. So it's really astonishingly accurate. 
Um, this, as I said, it defaults to 100 uh, measurements per second, but you can actually configure that. So if you want to do a more precise measurement fewer times per second, or if you want to do a less precise measurement much more quickly, you can do so. And that's for experimenting with uh, some of the less common digital modes you might want to use. So what WSJTX actually does is slides. It kind of slides from one tone to the next in a sort of um, a gentle way. And the reason for this is that a very sharp frequency transition is equivalent mathematically to a very, to, to a very sharp on-off keyed CW signal that will generate key clicks on all kinds of nearby adjacent frequencies and very, be very antisocial. So what QDX does is because it's measuring uh, 100 times per second, it, it actually follows that sliding frequency tone from one tone to the next. So it produces a very clean output. And this particular view here is showing the analysis with the scroll rate set to uh, one row every 10 milliseconds. So it's scrolling 100 times per second on the, on the screen. And you can see as one of the uh, FT8 tone changes from one tone to the next, how the intermediate tones are sort of following a raised cosine shape. And I chose here a quite extreme tone change from uh, quite a large frequency jump to illustrate the, the principle. So that's just showing how, how clean the, the, the output follows what WSJTX generates. So now onto something that this is onto some different blocks of the design of the schematic. And as I said, the most important thing to realize about QDX is that rather than being an SSB modulator, which takes an audio tone and modulates it onto RF using a single sideband modulator, what we do here is we measure the audio frequency coming from the PC and we add that to the USB dial frequency. And then we command this synthesizer chip, the SI5351A, which you see down here on the bottom right, um, to produce exactly that frequency. Now, the SI5351A is an amazing chip. It costs under a dollar. Uh, it's three by three millimeters in size, tiny little thing, but it produces three separate outputs, um, which can be on different frequencies but they can also be on the same frequency, but have a different phase relationship. And that's important here, as you'll see in a moment. And this uh, diagram here shows also the 25 megahertz TCXO, um, which is the reference oscillator for the synthesizer, but it was also the system clock for the 32-bit ARM microcontroller. And I did it that way, so there's only a single oscillator running in the system, because the last thing you want to be doing is creating uh, mixing products. Now, one of the interesting features here in the middle of the screen, you can see this uh, PNP NPN transistor buffer. And I wish I could remember where I found this on the internet. It's quite an interesting circuit. And it was, it was actually originally a, a crystal oscillator. And I found that it produces with this T PNP NPN transistor pair, a very low impedance output, which is kind of rail to rail almost. So if you use a 3.3 volts supply, as in this case, you'll get almost a 0 to 3.3 volt square wave come out of it. And it works with every kind of crystal that I tried, a whole wide range of different frequencies. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting crystal oscillator that I haven't seen anywhere else, and I can't find it again now. Um, so I found it on the internet somewhere um, and can't, can't find it again. It would be nice to be able to give a reference of where it came from. But um, the important point is it also works as an amplifier. So if I go back a slide, you can see that this TCXO produces a one volt peak to peak output, which is not enough to clock the 32 bit ARM micro microcontroller, which wants to see a 3.3 volt peak uh, square wave. So I use the transistor buffer here just as an amplifier. Um, in the first version of the QDX, I was using a 25 megahertz crystal without the TCXO reference. And I found that during the course of half an hour of operation, you would get maybe 50 hertz of frequency drift, which I considered to be un unacceptable. So I then retrofitted into that. And so it was also part of the, part of the kit, um, this TCXO board that replaced the crystal. But now it's all um, integrated on the board on the bottom side in the current version. Now, coming on to the power amplifier, and this is also why it's very, very important, this whole concept of generating the signal directly rather than as an SSB modulator. 
Um, because if you do an SSB modulator, you have quite a lot of circuit complexity to be able to do that well, to be able to produce a clean single byte sideband signal in an SSB exciter, which has a very low level of unwanted sideband as well as no level, a low level of uh, residual carrier. So it's quite complex to do that. And even after that, you then need a linear driver followed by a linear transmitter, a linear power amplifier. And all of that is what is, exists in a single sideband transceiver, but it's a lot of circuit complexity and quite a lot of cost as well. So the advantage really of generating this signal directly is that we don't have to have any linear modulator or linear power amplifier. We can use much simpler circuits, which also are lower cost as well as occupying less board space. So what I've done here is a kind of unusual amplifier, which again, I hadn't seen anywhere else and, and came up with myself, which is a class D push-pull amplifier. We normally think of class D in audio applications as a pulse width modulated um, uh, on-off switching amplifier at a much higher frequency than the audio frequency, which is being amplified. But I'm using the term here to refer to the class of operation of the transistors in the amplifier push-pull because it has two uh, transistors or in pairs of transistors in this case, which are acting in opposition to each other with 180, 180 degrees phase difference, which is similar to what happens in most linears. Um, but the very important point here is that it has a very low level of even harmonic output. I measured minus 70 dB with respect to the carrier um, with no low pass filter at all. And that's important because it allows you to use simpler low pass filtering, which again saves cost and board space. It's also a very high efficiency, although not as high as class E. And unlike class E, it's a broadband amplifier. So you can operate across multiple bands without having to do lots of switching and so on. So, so it's quite good in that way too. Now I'm using very low cost BS170 transistors and a 74ACT08 a discrete logic AND gate chip as the driver, which is convenient because the uh, threshold of switching is is perfect for the 3.3 volt peak to peak output of the SI5351A. And it produces a five volt drive, which is plenty to put the BS170s into an on state. So they're operating very much as a switch, a square wave switch. You need anti-phase drive to the two halves of the BS, uh, of the push-pull amplifier. And what you typically see in a linear amplifier at the front of it, you see a, a transformer which uh, splits the incoming signal into two phases. And um, where we get, I'm going to show you next, um, we have a situation here where we can use the two clock outputs from the SI5351A and configure that SI5351A chip by firmware, by software commands to it to produce these clock outputs with a, with a 180 degree phase difference. So it avoids using a transformer to split the phase, which you would see on a, on a typical SSB transmitter. So it avoids yet another component, which is again, reducing the cost. So it's a very, very clean, very exact 180 degree phase shift difference and, and really produces a very sort of clean, perfect output. So that gets put into two pairs of BS170 transistors. So there's actually four of them. And they're bolted against the PCB using a washer to, and a, a nut and bolt to hold the flats of the transistors down flat on the PCB surface. So the PCB, PCB itself is acting as the heat sink. Now, a lot of people have thought the washer is acting as a heat sink. That's in fact not the case because the curvature of the top of the transistors means that the heat transfer to that washer is, is very, very poor. There's not very much contact area. The actual point of the washer and the nut and bolt is to hold the flats of the transistors against the PCB surface. Then you also need a low, a, a, an output transformer, um, which is basically inverting the two halves of the signal with respect to each other, and then summing them up and putting them back together. So one half of the power amplifier produces a, an on pulse, which is the top half of the output sine wave in the end, and the other produces and, and exactly the same pulse, but with 180 degree phase shift difference, which you then invert and sum together to produce the final output sine wave. Except of course, we've got a square wave not a sine wave. So we then feed that into low pass filters to get rid of the harmonics and produce the sine wave. 
So you can build this, as I mentioned, either for five volt operation, sorry, nine volt operation or for 12 volt operation. Um, these are some measurements I made on the 40 meter band. Um, the blue line is the 12 volt operation line and the red line is the nine volt operation. Um, it's not particularly well adjusted. Uh, the blue line is actually somewhat higher than that in, actually, in reality. And this just depends on how you wind the output transformer, whether you use a three to two ratio uh, for 12 volts or whether you use a three to three volt ratio for nine volt operation. So that would be a matter of deciding, do you want to operate portable with nine volt batteries perhaps? And, and uh, if so, do you want to use the, the, the nine volt style or perhaps you want to operate with 12 volt more standard uh, power supply? The other surprisingly uh, nice thing about this was that it produced uh, five watts on each band, uh, very close to five watts on each band. It didn't seem to make very much difference uh, from 80 meters to 20 meters. Um, it was pretty good even at the high frequencies, just as good as it was at the low frequencies. And that's very refreshing because often it's quite hard to build an amplifier that does as well at high frequencies as it does at lower frequencies and have equal power across the bands. The low pass filters themselves um, are quite simple. They only have two torrids in each low pass filter. And um, I also included a third harmonic trap just to do even better. Um, the low second harmonic and low even harmonics generally mean that the, sim the design can be quite simplified. So um, for example, on the QCX transceiver, which is class E output stage, we have a seven element low pass filter, uh, three torrids and four capacitors, whereas here we only have two torrids. So it again simplifies and reduces the cost and, and the construction difficulty. Um, there is also the possibility to share the 30 meter and 20 meter low pass filter um, through one, just through one filter. Um, this is often seen on sideband transceivers uh, with adjacent bands such as 30 meter and 20 meter and particularly the higher frequency bands, because again, often the sideband tr transceiver uh, will be using a push-pull linear amplifier, and theoretically they should generate a very low level of even harmonics and a very low level of any kind of harmonics, in fact, because they're supposed to be linear. So in this application, you know, the, the design of how many low-pass filters you have and what they are is really dictated by the signal that you're putting into it from the power amplifier and because we have a low level of even harmonics, the first harmonic we have to worry about much is the third harmonic. And it means we can get away with a much simpler type of low pass filter design with less torrids in it. This is a spectrum analyzer screenshot showing the 40 meter band result. And you can see that really the harmonics disappear into the noise very, very quickly, um, almost you can't even see the third harmonica or anything higher than that. So it's a very, very clean output. So even these two torrids in the output may well be overkill um, more than is necessary. Now the switching is another important feature of the kit and uh, both the transmit receive switching as well as the low pass filter switching. So I came to kind of dislike relays and for, as a kit producer, they're quite expensive and they're heavy, they're mechanical, they're noisy, they're slow. Being slow doesn't really matter in this application, but in something like the QCX, which wants to implement full break-in CW operation, uh, if you do that with relays, uh, the relays have quite a short lifetime. The radio clacks and clatters as you operate, and it's also rather slow um, for anything other than very slow CW. But um, here, that doesn't matter so much, the, the slow side of things. But the important thing here is that uh, by using pin dial switching, it's able to use a lot less board area as well as lower the cost. And we find that the 1N4007, which is a basic rectifier diode having a, a 1000 volt reverse rating, has a very similar construction to a real pin diode. So pin stands for the positive doped region semiconductor at one end and a negative doped region at the other end, and this intrinsic region in the middle, which you can think of as a kind of neutral region. And the, 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 because it's such a high voltage diode, the construction is very similar to a real pin diode, and it's found to operate very much as a, as a 
the same as a real pin diode. So rather than rectifying the signal, it's so slow that it passes the signal like a switch. And the rules for operating a, a pin diode as a switch are very important to understand, and it actually causes a, lo a lot of confusion. And there are quite a few commercial radios out there which don't actually do this properly. Um, the rules are that if you want the switch to be on, you have to pass in a bias current, a forward bias current, but not just any forward bias current. You actually need to use more, uh, a higher level of current through the diode, the more power that you want to be able to switch. If you do not pass enough bias current in, you start getting distortion. And then basically it starts acting somewhat as a rectifier, which means you're putting back the second harmonic and the even harmonics, exactly the things that you wanted to remove by the low pass filter. So you've got to be very careful to put in enough milliamp through that uh, pin diode to avoid any distortion. And then in the off case, you need a reverse bias voltage that's larger than the signal that's being blocked. And that's a bit of a challenge too, because you think here if we're doing a five volt, uh, sorry, a five watt power output, and a five watt power is a 45 volt peak to peak voltage. And yet here we are with a device which can be powered with nine volts or with 12 volts. So where are we gonna get that high voltage from? And the answer is we get that high voltage from the signal itself. So if you look here on the right hand side of this circuit diagram fragment here, these diodes on the on the right hand side here are actually a voltage doubler. So uh, they're rectifying and doubling that signal that comes out from the power amplifier. So we're actually generating our own high voltage by rectifying and doubling the signal itself. And uh, you know, even after some losses through the doubler, you still get a signal which is substantially bigger, uh, a voltage which is substantially bigger than the amplitude of the signal. And that then can be used to apply to the uh, diodes in reverse, such that the diodes are really completely switched off. And so that's how this uh, circuit works in the off state. It passes that high voltage through an inductor, which blocks the RF and let, just lets the DC through to the diodes um, and reverse biases them with a high voltage. And then in the on state, I'm passing 38 milliamps through each of these diodes which is found to be plenty to stop there from being any distortion through them. And again, there's uh, blocking inductors to block the RF and a transistor, which is switched on by the microcontroller to pull the current down through both of those inductors in the low pass filter. So you get 38 milliamps going through each diode. Um, you notice that the diodes are also back to back and this also helps to reduce distortion. So the even or even harmonic distortions cancel out when the diodes are back to back. So although you've got some additional, you know, probably a lot more components and a lot more thinking to do than you have to do if you have relays, a you know, relay is just literally applying the voltage you want the relay to be switched on and not if you want it switched off. And it's a very easy, perfect switch. Um, you have a lot more thinking to do in the case of pin diodes, but the end result is definitely worth it in terms of uh, reducing the costs. These things, you know, one end 4,007 in quantities of thousands costs a matter of pence. You know, it's a very, very low cost solution. So everything you can see is, is designed to uh, reduce the cost and increase the performance. At this point in the presentation, I've just wanted to give a brief overview of block diagram of the whole transceiver, just so that we don't forget where we are. Um, so far, I've just talked about really the bottom half of this with the synthesizer, the power amplifier, and the low-pass filters, and their switching. Now I'm going to talk briefly about the top part, which is how the receive section works. <coughs> so this is the receive section, and the radio signal comes in on the left-hand side here through a set of bandpass filters. The bandpass filters I'll show you in a moment, and that feeds into a double balanced quadrature sampling detector, which produces I and Q baseband signals. And this is a very common technique these days for producing baseband signals, which are then demodulated in software in an STR. That goes into low noise preamplifiers and from there into an analog to digital converter. So the first of those stages is the bandpass filter 
and I implemented a very simple bandpass filter with a single uh, LC resonance circuit in a series configuration. Um, it doesn't have a very, very narrow response or a very fast drop off, but it's enough to exclude some of the strong broadcast band signals and strong signals uh, that might be hitting the mixer. So it just uses four capacitors and a large tapped inductor. One of those taps is selected and one of those capacitors is selected by signals from the microcontroller, depending on what band you're going to operate on. Um, so all of that is controlled by the microcontroller automatically according to what information or what commands it receives over the CAT control interface. This screenshot here is a uh, is showing there's a tool in the terminal applications um, where the third output, so you remember I said that the SI5351A actually has three independent outputs which can be on different frequencies or can be on the same frequency with different phase shifts. So what we actually do here is use the first of those two outputs with a 90 degrees, 90 degree phase offset to uh, operate the demodulator and the third output is used as a signal generator and is passed into the front end of the radio. And so this is a, a so it allows you to generate a frequency sweep. And what this shows here is a 40 meter band sweep of which shows how the bandpass filter is looking. So in this case, I'm covering from five megahertz to nine megahertz and sweeping the RF uh, across that range. And you can see that it's peaking um, somewhat to the left, so I'm not sure if you can see on the screen here, but around about the middle of the screen is a solid blue line which represents where the 40 meter band is. And you can see that the peak is somewhat to the left of that. And so this can be used by the uh, kit constructor to effectively tune up the filters if they want to. This is probably only a few dB in it, so it's not terribly important, but if you want to really get the most out of it, you can use these tools uh, these built-in alignment tools to tweak the inductor values by squeezing and compressing the turns uh, of the inductor in the bandpass filter. Now, this is the quadrature sampling detector. Um, it uses a trifilar transformer uh, at the front there to split the phase into two parts, which is important for the double balanced part of the, of the mixer. Um, so that gets rid of uh, common mode uh, currents and uh, AM detection, things like that. Power supply noise is very important. Um, the clock signal coming from the local oscillator has a 90 degrees phase offset, and that's all generated in the synthesizer chip itself directly uh, under command from the microcontroller. So I worked out ways where ways to configure the si 5351 a to be able to produce that 90 degree phase offset. And um, that was something that was very difficult to do. It was not at all described in the documentation for the chip. And it's something that I did originally for the si 5351 a um, synthesizer. And uh, I published how I did that, and quite a few people have been doing it, same thing since then. And so the outputs, you get outputs there on four integrated capacitors, which is shown there at the bottom right. And you essentially get the same sine wave signal that you're detecting on each of those capacitors, but with a 90 degree phase shift relative to each, to, to each other. So you get four phases come out of that, that could then go into the audio amplifiers. Now these audio amplifiers are tremendously important. They actually determine the performance of the whole radio. So it's important to use an op amp with a low input noise. Here I'm using the LM4562. And it's important to get things like the gain of the op amps optimum for the, for the gain distribution of the receiver. So there was an additional complication here in the, you know, the original um, QDXs, which I actually manufactured before the pandemic, used the chip, the AK5386 as the ADC, which became obsolete during the pandemic and has basically not just because of the global chip shortage, but also because of a fire at the factory in Japan, which produced the chips. And so I had to change for the third version of the PCB, the third batch, I had to change to a different chip. Now I'm using the PCM1804 Texas Instruments ADC chip, which is, is uh, it has a differential input. And what that means is if you want to uh, measure, for example, a 1000 Hertz sine wave, you need to feed two 
versions of that 1000 hertz sine wave into a positive and a negative input of the ADC chip um, with 180 degree phase difference. Now you could simply feed it into one input and ground the other one, but you would lose 6 dB of the performance of the ADC. And so um, for the maximum performance, I, I wanted to actually drive this properly. And what I came up with is this two op amp uh, amplifier, which takes the zero degrees and the 180 degrees uh, example from the uh, quadrature sampler detector and applies this kind of instrumentation amplifier configuration which is extremely well balanced. And so the impedance on it is, is very high on both of those inputs. And it's a very balanced configuration and produces the necessary differential drive for the ADC chip. So normally an instrumentation amplifier would have a third op amp on the right there, which would uh, <coughs> um, do the differencing of those two. But in this case, that function is done by the ADC itself. Excuse me a moment, my throat's getting very dry here. Just a reminder then to everybody watching this at home, <clears throat> if you've got any comments, maybe you're a QCX user, maybe you've made, uh, used some of other uh, kits from Hans or anything, questions regarding the QDX that Hans is talking about tonight, just pop them onto BATC or Facebook. Thanks Dave, that's our commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I do have quite a source right. I actually came back from FDIM with COVID-19, um, as did a lot of people. It was kind of a super spreader event in some ways. Um, it's been very mild, but I do have a bit of a sore throat and some, some symptoms from it. Yeah, well, so, we, we were anyway. very grateful for you, Carrie, you know, doing this tonight. <laughs> yeah, luckily, we're not in person, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so this produces um, the differential output that is exactly what the ADC chip needs for its differential drive. And it also references everything to a common voltage level, which is an output pin from the ADC chip as well. So for every last dB of performance and dynamic range that you want to get, th this circuit has to be designed very carefully. And I went through about three months of development between the second batches of QDX and the third batch of QDX to be able to get this all set up and working perfectly. So it was quite a, a tough thing to have to do. Um, now here is the ADC chip. There's not very much to see here. It's basically using the recommended configuration in the PCM1804 datasheet in regards to using uh, 10 microfarad tantalum capacitors on the reference level outputs and, and so on. Um, and the output, the important thing is that the output from this chip is a digital inter IC sound bus format, I2S, uh, which is read by the microcontroller directly. So it gets a whole stream of these 24-bit values coming into the microcontroller, 48,000 samples per second. So now software-defined radio and why we use a software-defined radio, I actually came to the conclusion, so you remember that QCX, for example, is an all-analog radio, although it has a microcontroller um, controlling all aspects of it, and producing all the features such as the uh, multiple VFOs, and the RIT operation, KIA, all of these features, side tone, all of that in QCX is generated by a microcontroller, but the actual signal path is all analog. But I actually came to the conclusion after doing that 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 would probably be the last all analog radio I designed, um, because when you go to software defined radio, you have a much higher performance to cost ratio. And um, well, at the time, the microcontrollers were very cheap and easy to come by. Uh, of course, now in the chip crisis, that's no longer the case. But uh, still, I think the performance to cost ratio is, is very good for a software defined radio. And of course, you also have the, the chance then in future to update the features and to add more features uh, as you go. And you have the opportunity to include digital signal processing to, to really get high performance. So what QZX actually does is implement a superhead receiver with a 12 kilohertz intermediate frequency. And the reason for doing that is if you use a direct conversion receiver, you often get these sort of hum artifacts at the low, at the near ground, near the, near the DC frequency, um, because it's very hard to get rid of every kind of 
remnant of hum which exists on the power supply lines or can get into your antenna somehow. So with a 12 kilohertz intermediate frequency superhet, all implemented in software, um, you can actually eliminate all those problems. So QDX does all its processing internally as 32-bit floating point uh, representation. It, the ARM microcontroller I'm using includes its own floating point unit and DSP instructions. So it, uh, it really fits very well to this application. And it provides 24-bit audio back to the PC across that uh, USB connection. So it really provides a very high performance radio receiver. Now, we actually had one guy who popped up on the mail forum in the, on the QRP Labs forum in the early days of the first batch of QDX. And he had his commercial radio, which um, I'm not joking, I can't remember whether it was a Yesu or an Icom or a Kenwood, but it was one of those three. And he said, there's something wrong with my QDX because when I'm looking at the FT8 band, uh, I see all these signals on my ICOM, say, it may have been one of the others, I don't remember. I see all these signals on my ICOM, and between the signals, there are gaps. But on the QDX, in between the signals, I see other signals, other weak signals. So what's wrong with my QDX? And the answer was that there's nothing wrong with your QDX. It just has a very, very high performance and is picking up stations which your big commercial radio can't actually see. And we're able to do that because of the optimizations which have been implemented in QDX with this very high dynamic range ADC chip and the software defined radio, which is really tailored precisely to the application. Now here is another output from the terminal uh, applications I was talking about when you connect a, a PuTTY terminal across the serial port to the QDX, um, which allows you to sweep as a signal generator on that second output, uh, the CLK2 output, or the third output, rather, with the SI5351A across the audio band. And this allows you to see the uh, pass band, that, that's the yellow line at the top there, um, of the QDX. So you can see it produces a pass band from 150 hertz to about 3.2 kilohertz, and a very, very sharp cutoff, uh, which is because of digital filtering at, at either end. It has around 60 or 70 dB of unwanted sideband cancellation and about 40 dB of uh, image rejection uh, for the superhead. And those figures are, are more than good enough for the application here. Although with further software refinements, they could be improved and that may be something I come to at some point in the future. But it wasn't necessary for the, for the current thing to get it off the, uh, off the production line into, into people's hands. So just some more examples from the terminal uh, screen when you connect a party terminal to the QDX. You have this configuration screen here, which allows you to specify whether you use USB or LSB, upper or lower sideband. Um, always digital modes are using upper sideband, but if there was some reason why you wanted to use lower sideband instead, you'd be able to do that. Uh, it allows you to trim the TCXO frequency if you find it's a hertz or two off. In practice, we find the TCXO frequency is generally within about plus or minus five hertz of, of 25 megahertz, very surprisingly accurate. And you can specify here also the audio gain and the default startup frequency, um, whether uh, voice operated transmission is enabled and various parameters to do with the sample measurement. And there's also an IQ mode which allows those 24-bit 48,000 samples per second raw from the analog digital converter chip to be streamed directly into a PC. So you can then use conventional SDR software on a PC to do the demodulation. So you can operate it as a general coverage, all modes receiver using software-defined radio uh, software on a PC and just using the QDX as a front end without doing demodulation on the, Q, on the QDX. There's a Japanese band limits uh, thing there at the bottom as well. That's a, a requirement for use in Japan. Uh, they're not allowed to operate outside the band limits. But the radio has to implement those restrictions itself. So another couple of other things, there's the reverse polarity protection. Um, probably a lot of you who've built kits and have at some point connected something backwards and you know that the thing very quickly dies. And so it's very nice to have some reverse polarity protection 
in place to prevent that from happening. And what we commonly see and what's in the QCX, for example, is a, a simple diode which uh, conducts in one direction and not the other direction. The disadvantage of that is you get a voltage drop across the diode. In the QCX, we are using a shock key diode, which has about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 volts voltage drop. So it's a low voltage drop, but there is still that voltage drop. Now, if you use a P-channel MOSFET, such as we do here in QDX, you get a very, very low voltage drop, uh, you know, just a few tens of milliamps, even at one amp current through it. And the way to do this is to kind of connect the P-channel MOSFET backwards um, so that instead of having the source connected to the positive input, you have the drain connected to the positive input. And um, it actually uh, works perfectly in this configuration and uh, is, it's the way to do it for uh, reverse polarity protection. Now, on the final section of uh, what I want to talk about here, um, the production challenges of QDX. So the first 500 went on sale in October and sold out in just under 15 minutes. So it was extremely rapid sales on the, on the shop, on the QRP Lab shop. Um, overloaded the server, which kept crashing, and people had to keep clicking several times. So we then upgraded the server to a higher performance model uh, that the QRP Labs website was hosted on. And for the second batch of 385 that I sold in December, they sold out in just under five minutes. So it's four minutes, 44 seconds. In fact, they oversold by about 80 orders because the shop itself kept on taking orders before it even realized that it was out of stock. And so those people had to wait six months for the third batch. Now, I had all of those components to make those boards, those first 885 boards in stock since before the pandemic and before the global semiconductor crisis, which I'm sure that most of you have heard about um, and which is affecting all industries, really, and, and um, particularly uh, we hear about the car industry. Some of the car manufacturers have gone back to having analog speedos and things because they just can't get the semiconductors anymore that they need. The average modern car includes about 100 microcontroller chips, I heard. So um, it's uh, quite a severe issue. And the more of those chips that you have, the more different chips you have, I guess the more higher prob probability you have of something being unavailable. There's a lot of theories for why the global semiconductor shortage is happening, but um, I think most probably it's a thing like the toilet paper shortage in the pandemic. Um, you know, why did toilet paper sell out in the supermarkets? Uh, COVID-19 never caused diarrhea. So why was the sudden rush on toilet paper? And it, it's just once people start rushing to buy something and it, there gets rumors of it running out, then the natural uh, tendency is to grab some as quick as you can. And it was the same with chips. And even, you know, I myself was guilty of that with the QCX. Um, we depended very critically on the SI 53518A chip. And as soon as I saw that that thing was running out, I just rushed and bought as many as I could. And as a manufacturer, it makes sense to do that because if you can't get your raw materials to make your product, you can't make your product and you can't continue your business. And so it makes sense for every manufacturer to just try and guarantee their supply by buying us up as much as they can before their competitors do. And before you know what's happened, the everything is sold out and you can't buy it ever, ever again. And so I, I think that this is the kind of thing that's happened mostly in, in the semiconductor industry, as well as it was not helped by closures in the, in the pandemic due to uh, lockdowns and so on. So as I mentioned, I had to change the ADC chip from the AK-538-6 AK to the PCM-1804. And it's a very interesting story. I won't go into how I actually came by those chips, but to cut a long story short, I had to buy 3,000 sets of PCM-1804 and microcontroller chips before I had done the design changes to verify that it actually worked as it was supposed to. And before I had done a prototype board, a new board layout for it and everything, um, I actually had to buy those chips because I knew that there was a strong possibility that if I did the design changes first and prototyping and everything, and it took me three months, then by the time I came back again, I might be in the same situation again where I could no longer get that ADC chip and then all, all the way back to square one and have to try and find another one to do um, and so on. So 
it was quite a leap of faith, quite a gamble in a way, to actually buy those 3,000 chips um, before I'd even done any designing. Uh, on top of that, of course, they were much more expensive than they were before the pandemic um, because prices have gone up massively as well as, as the availability is, has uh, dried up. On top of that, we had trouble with board manufacturing and taking longer than expected. And all the factories are very, very busy. And there's been lockdowns, which has made them even busier. There's logistics problems because all of the <coughs> all of the courier services like FedEx and TNT and DHL uh, all very heavily overloaded for the last couple of years because people are doing more stuff online than they used to. So there have been a huge number of challenges, and it's very interesting to observe the difference between how it was when I made the first batch of QDXs uh, at the end of 2019 and how it is today. Very, very different world indeed. It used to be that you could just pop on the DigiKey website, click, 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 type in the credit card number, and you've bought all the components that you need. You'd never, ever find anything out of stock. Um, now you go to the DigiKey website, everything is stock zero everything you want zero stock same with farnell rs in the uk wherever you go no stock <clears throat> and so very very difficult world very hard to survive so some frequently asked questions and uh, this will probably uh, dave will probably think think of that uh, when some of the questions come through that may have been answered in, in this section Firstly, can it do CW? Uh, no, it can't. And the reason for that was that technically it could do CW if you keyed it with FL Digi, for example, a rig which converts keyboard morse into on-off keying. It could do CW, but it doesn't include any envelope shaping. So you'd quickly become very unpopular because you'd be generating key clicks at every single key down and key up. So it's not a CW transceiver. It was not designed to be able to do that. Um, there's no key shaping because that was something that wasn't so necessary really for digital modes. Um, can it do PSK? It can't do PSK. And the reason for this is because it's the only mode that is supported by QDX is FSK modes, frequency shift key modes with a single tone on them. Now, a phase shift keyed mode is equivalent to having two tones simultaneously and that needs a single sideband transceiver with a linear power amplifier, linear modulator, and all of that. And so it, it, we, it was specific uh, design choice for the optimization for the high performance to cost ratio to make it only be able to do frequency shift key modes. Now, that's not such a serious limitation because most of the vast majority of the digital modes that are popular today are actually FSK, FSK modes. So in particular, all the modes in the WSJTX software, like FT8, as well as the JS8 core variant of it, all of these are frequency shift keyed modes. Can it do blah, blah, blah mode? Well, this is something I've been asked a lot. Can it do this? Can it do that? And the answer is, is that mode a single tone FSK mode? Or is it something that uses phase shift keying? Is it something that uses multiple tones concurrently? Um, if it's a single FSK mode, then QDX can do it. If it's something that has multiple tones or phase shift keying involved, then no, it can't. Do you have some with you? Well, that's the leftover from the, <laughs> from the FDM talk uh, uh, the week before last. So it obviously doesn't apply here. But you might be interested in, in any way what is the situation with supply. And the situation is that the third batch which I manufactured was 2,000 QDX kits. And they were sold out in 12 days uh, from the 1st of May to the 13th of May. Those 2000 QDX kits were all sold out. And so I am now manufacturing a fourth batch. Um, so you remember I bought 3000 sets of components uh, and I have used 2000 of those in the third batch, which means I have 1000 left over to be making a fourth batch with. So I've now started making that fourth batch and I estimate that that will be ready in early July. So I'm taking pre-orders on the QRP Labs shop for um, the third batch of, sorry, the fourth batch of QDX, which should be available in early July. Normally, I don't like taking pre-orders because it's very stressful. And if you go beyond your deadlines, you end up getting a lot of hate mail and that becomes very stressful. Um, 
I, of course, a lot of manufacturers do it because it allows them to put a lot of money in, ha in their pockets uh, up front and use that to finance the manufacturing. But um, I'm very, very much against that for, because it's just not worth the stress and the, and the bad customer relations it causes. So, but in this case, I decided to take the pre-orders because I don't have any concerns about not being able to get the parts because I have the uh, critical parts in stock. And so it's just a matter of manufacturing them and getting the boards made. Is the firmware open source? The firmware is not open source. And uh, the reason for this is because it's my, you know, my uh, business, my livelihood, which feeds the family. And I know the debates between open source and uh, closed source, and I decided to, to keep it closed. And um, so, you know, from my point of view, when I look at the risks which could uh, end the business, essentially, um, one of the big risks is cloning. Uh, we often think of cloning from the Far East, but in fact, um, there is a lot of risk of cloning from many places closer to home. Uh, a lot of stories on that. Um, but, you know, if, if cloning occurred, that would seriously uh, damage the, the product viability and would be a very serious risk. Of course, other risks include um, uh, component shortages, not being able to get the raw materials is another very big risk today. But uh, before that, the, the uh, issue of cloning is a big one. And copying hardware is very easy. You can look at the circuit board and you can find, trace through the, you know, the connections and uh, everybody anyway wants to see a, a schematic in the documentation to be able to uh, make their modifications or repairs if they need to. So copying hardware is quite easy, but uh, you want to make sure that uh, people can't easily copy the firmware. Uh, which is also why I mentioned I have 256 AES encryption, 256 bit AES encryption uh, on the firmware. To put that in perspective, when you do a credit card transaction online, that's actually using 128 bit encryption. 256 bit encryption, assuming that you could randomly test permutations in zero time, uh, which of course you couldn't in practice, would take all the computers on the earth. 10 to the power of 52 times the age of the universe to crack. So essentially it's not gonna happen. So after all my no's, five no's in a row, um, will it work on other bands from 80, 40, 30 and 20 meters? The answer is also no, but at least I'm going to be rectifying that shortly. Um, as I said, it will work on 60 meters in, in the current version. But I'm also uh, working on a new firmware version at the moment, which will allow you to configure your own bands, um, whatever, whatever you want to configure it to. And then it would be a matter of changing filter components. I'm also planning to come out with a high bands version that will cover 10 meters to 20 meter, 20 meter bands. Um, and I'm hoping to make a low bands version, which covers 630, 160 meters and 80 meters. So those would kind of be three official versions, uh, the current version, mid-band version, and then a high-band HF version and a low-band version. Um, but people who wanted to experiment with their own bands would also be able to do so. So finally, that's the end of the presentation and a quick summary of the, of the project. Um, very successful project from my view. I just wish we were not in this uh, horrible situation of not being able to get parts, uh, which is a real uh, blocker on the situation. Um, you know, think about the first batch of 500 sold in 15 minutes, the second batch sold in under five minutes, and then the last 2000, which have been sold in uh, 12 days. Uh, so it's clearly a very, very popular product. Um, it would just be nice to be able to manufacture it, manufacture it easily and quickly. So it has very fantastic performance, lots of features. Um, the terminal applications are very useful for squeezing more performance out and also for testing things and for learning about how it works. Um, there's a cat control screen where you can type in cat commands to test them. There's a uh, error log so you can actually log if there are any cat errors. So for example, if you use software which it hadn't been designed for, you would be able to see if there are any cat commands which were not understood and then uh, send me an email, Hans, can you add that to the firmware and that would be something that would be possible. So uh, there's a lot of flexible features involved, very high performance. 
it's also a very affordable radio. I converted the price into pounds. So it's uh, 55 pounds for the kit and 16 pounds for the aluminium, the black aluminium extruded anodized laser printed enclosure. And there at the end is just the web page uh, of the main web page uh, for all the firmware, all the documentation. You find very extensive documentation. Um, there's a lot of support available from the QRP Labs forum um, and, and so on. So that's about it. That's the end of the presentation. So uh, thanks very much for listening and watching. And I hope it's been interesting and my voice has been deteriorating steadily <laughs> as I've gone through. Um, but I hope it's been interesting and, you know, there's, there's ideas in there if you want to do your own homebrew projects, things like the um, push-pull Class D power lamp fire, I think are going to end up uh, popping up in other projects than this because it's a really nice technique to be able to produce a 5-watt amplifier at 9-volt supply um, very efficiently and effectively with few components. Things like the pin diode switching, I think, will also become uh, more popular uh, because of the advantages over relays. So hopefully, you know, if there are any of you homebrewing your own designs, you might have found some ideas from this. If you're interested in building things, it's a nice kit to build and a high performance way to get into digital modes. So thanks again. And uh, let's see if we have any questions, Dave. Thank you. Yeah, well, I think it's about time we gave you a break anyway. So do <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> grab that uh, drink there and um, well-earned drink. So if you haven't already made a comment or a question, we've got a couple to read to uh, Hans, then you, this is the time to do it. And whilst uh, Hans is just taking that drink, just like to remind everybody, um, Hans has gone into absolutely quite technical depths, um, but I'm well aware that many of you might be on a foundation level, not done much electronics or whatever. And I think, uh, although I'm sure Hans will tell you himself, you don't need to know all of this to use this product. It's very important. Um, even the assembly of it looks quite si si much more simpler, I'd have said, than the QCX, which actually Tammy made our kit. So we can maybe talk about that to Hans in a moment. But So don't be afraid of that. Um, but Hans, it's nice to see you go into the technical. In fact, we had a comment from one of our members, um, Hans, to, to kick us off. And... Nev actually was really writing to Roger, our program secretary, and saying, please try and arrange more technical talks at this level, because he enjoyed it so much. Um, and in fact, he said to you, a brilliant presentation. It shows a great use of lateral thinking to create something complex, but easy to understand. So a, a compliment there. And we've got quite a few compliments like that, actually. Um, uh, let me have a look here. Yeah, so Phil... G6AIO says, very interesting talk. I've been toying with the idea of digital modes recently, so that should get him involved with that. Uh, Bob, uh, G6P, uh, uh, Bob Fuller, sorry, you haven't got your call son. I'm try I try and remember. Um, uh, very interesting talk. Thank you all to especially to Hans. And uh, Martin, M0KXKM, waving hellos. I'm looking forward to my QDX making it here, currently in Autica. Uh, not sure when, but I'll have time to build and run it. But I'm very excited. A great talk, hence. Thanks. So there's lots of uh, compliments and things for you. I've got a, a couple of questions. Um, well, for another comment, actually, from, from an actual user. Uh, Bruce K G4KZT says, Hans, any, uh, I can vouch for the QDX. I was fortunate to get one of the first batch, and it worked first time, he said. So back to you, Hans. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Well, thanks for all the comments. And uh, yes, the Autager is the town 12 kilometers up the road from here. And uh, when we ship things, we, we actually offer TNT shipping, which is a division of FedEx or post office shipping. And if you use the post office shipping, it, it goes there first and, and from there uh, leaves the country fairly quickly in about three days. Um, TNT shipping goes out via Ismia. So that's just up the road. I should mention that there's a lot of the things I've talked about now are necessarily the fairly shallow level um, because we only have about an hour to talk about it. But if you look at the manual on the website, the assembly manual is just not a, it's not just a, a bunch of pictures about where to stuff what components. It's also got a very, very extensive uh, section detailing all the theories and the reasoning behind the design, all the things I've spoken about tonight. Um, in a lot more detail. 
There's also a conference preceding article I wrote for FDIM to accompany this talk, and I will at some point uh, put that on the website as well. So um, there's a lot more technical detail available if you, if you want it. But as you said, Dave, that you know it, it doesn't need all of that to be able to build it. Um, you need to know how to count, which hopefully most of us can do. Um, you need to just count the number of turns you put on those toroids. You need to know how to solder. You need to be relatively careful with some of the soldering because there are these SMD components on the reverse side, but it's not really difficult. It, it's just a matter of being careful and methodical about it. It's quite easy to build. You know, it takes me about an hour to build one of these. It's, it's a much quicker project than a QCX. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, as I said, Tammy, you made um, our QCX and I think there was only a very limited amount of surface mount on that and most of it was conventional components and it did take quite a long time to build that actually didn't it yeah. so this is quite I mean, a lot simpler to build would you say there was the original qcx which was all through whole components the only smd on there was the fs3253 uh, multiplexer used in the quadrature sampling detector and the si 5351a chip because those chips are only available in smd mm. everything else was through whole um, the two, Q, two QCX models we have now are the QCX Plus, uh, which again is all through hole apart from those two components, and the QCX Mini. The QCX Mini is a very tiny version. I'll show you one here. That's um, mm. where's the camera? This end, I yeah, guess. We've got that there. So, so that that's uh, the QCX Mini. So it's like a a very miniaturized version of the QCX, and very good for portable operations. And that's mostly smd inside um this is how it goes together inside so that's quite involved to build that you know, on two different layers boards and uh very sort of fine high density construction it's quite tricky to build it so really the qdx is yeah a much a much easier project much easier project to do um just a matter of the capacitors winding the torrents and installing the connectors Mm. Um, so anybody can do it as long as they can count and soldier and, and be methodical about it. And, and I think as well, if, if several club members buy it, and I've ordered mine yesterday, as I think I told you earlier as well, so I'm hoping to get mine sometime in July. And if, if several people buy it, um, I, I'm certainly happy to build mine or build it with Tammy. Um, and then we can maybe share and help others with it if they can't, because it is mainly soldering conventional components. So if this is yeah. putting you off, um, build it with you because you're worried about buy, building it, I wouldn't build it for you, but I'd happy to show you how to build it. You know, it's a uh, teach a man to fish type idea. So um, yeah. I'm sure as a club, that's something we can do now that we've started meeting again as well. You, you'll find it, I think, much easier than much easier than the QCX. And yeah. um, the QCX has several adjustments to it, five in total, and the contrast potential to the easy one. But then the bandpass peak, peaking and the... Um, IQ balance and the unwanted sideband phasing cancellation. In the QDX, you don't have any of that. There are no there are no trimmers to adjust. And if you really want to go to town on it, you start compressing and stretching turns on torres to tweak out the last bit of performance. But you wouldn't need to do any of that. You could just stuff the board and start operating it. And hmm. uh, literally on my first prototype, which I built, and the first half an hour of operation that I did, I had F58 contacts all around Europe, as well as two in Japan. And that was just with a very sort of mediocre off-center fed dipole antenna, nothing special here, and a very typical average suburban location. Um, no special amazing antenna farm or beam on top of a massive tower or anything like that, just with very basic average antennas and five watts. I had two Japanese stations in the log and all around Europe. Um, I've had QSOs to America, New Zealand, Australia on JS8 call, um, very nice chats to Australia. And, and mm. all of that, you know, if conditions are right, that's what you get um, with very average antennas and five watts of power. Um, if you conditions say, are so more... Sorry, beg your pardon. Yeah, if, if conditions are more average, then 2,000, 3,000 kilometers is, is the norm. Um, but that was just, you know, I literally just built the prototype and turned it on on 40 meters and, and there's no adjustment to do or anything. It's very easy to build. Yeah. 
all digital, I guess. It's all synthesised. And, yeah, yeah. And so, so and make it a, an ideal QRP sort of portable setup, wouldn't it, really? As you said, you know, you can run it off 9 volts and 12 volts if you've yeah. got 12 volts. And, yeah. So you need that, I guess, and a computer. Uh, yeah, and, a small and a, laptop, yeah. Raspberry Pi. Yeah, mm. It could be done with a Raspberry Pi very easily, small laptop. People can do that. There's, I think, even a, a phone app which does FT8 now. Um, so, yeah, so, so for the some of the SOTA operators, if they have to reach a certain target, the number of QSOs they do, <laughs> they take it up the mountain and they do their hard work on getting some CW contacts. And then if they don't quite manage it, they just have the... Uh, have the uh, QDX with them and, and make a few digital contacts ways, easily yeah. to, to get the numbers they need. <laughs> I mean, you've mentioned this, you know, the contacts that you've made and things. I, I wonder when you're running such a busy company, it's really <laughs> successful selling lots of products now. Do you have much time yeah. yourself to enjoy the hobby? No, I don't. No, it's a big regret of mine. Um, I have in the last year had one or two CW QSOs, and that was when I had people come to the lab who wondered you know we get visitors who just have no idea what is ham radio and what i'm doing and so i have to switch on the radio so oh, this is morse code you know they might recognize it from the movies mm -hmm. um send out a cq or two have to have a qso to demonstrate and so but i have done very little enjoyment of the hobby myself unfortunately and it's in some ways it's a regret of mine but on the other hand there's a kind of make hay while the sun shines attitude. Yeah. And, um, you know, where are we going to be in five years time, 10 years time? Nobody knows. And will it still be possible to make a living from the hobby? We don't know. So, um, or, or from, from the, a business like this, a small business like this in the hobby, we don't know. There's a lot of challenges. There's the parts worries. There's, and we don't know when that's going to resolve. Nobody knows how long it will be until that resolves. There's the risk of cloning, um, a lot of governments around the world are making it harder and harder for small businesses to, to survive uh, with bureaucracy, ever-increasing bureaucracy, with import taxes and making it harder to ship things internationally. And so who knows how long it will go on for. So I kind of think to myself, yeah, I'm not having too much enjoyment of the hobby myself, but um, make hay while the sun shines and who knows where it will all end up and that hopefully... You know, I'll be around for a few more years to come and one day I'll have more time to enjoy the hobby. And, and um, yeah, there's family challenges as well, balancing with family. I have quite a young family, three kids, eight years, six years and two years old. Mm. Um, so That's quick. It keeps you quite busy, I would imagine, you and your yeah, wife. Yeah, between, between that and the thousands of QRP Labs customers, um, there isn't very much time. But I do, you know, I, one, one thing I do is have QDX running here during the day and I have JS8 call. I've quite enjoyed JS8 call and uh, chat modes. It's more uh, keyboard to keyboard chat rather than just a uh, quick QSO like FT8 provides, which is merely the computer making mm. the contact and logging it. And, and so JS8 is much more like a traditional uh, chat. And so I often leave it running on JS8 and I set, you can set JS8 up so that if there's a CQ, on the band or if somebody sends you a message directly or calls you directly it plays a noise on the computer to alert you to that and so i often have that running on 20 meters in the day and, and you, know, you have a qso or two during the day and it's a nice break from other work so um it kind of yeah it ticks over in the background a bit of hobby activity but um i'm okay clearly passionate about the hobby as well otherwise it wouldn't give you the inspiration to come up with products right. like this which which you know, really are needed. Uh, one of the things I noted that you, you said how good the receiver was on there. Uh, we haven't had a question, but it's my question. If I if I can, uh, is it? A, can you use it just as a receiver, or is it only really suitable for these digital modes? Is there any other way of uh, using it just as a really good receiver? Yes, I mean it. it you you can. Um, you obviously don't have a tuning knob that you can tune around as you would do on on your normal receiver, but it basically has a single sideband output with a bandwidth from 150 hertz to 3.2 kilohertz so provided you've got some software to send a cat command to put it on the frequency you want to listen to um, this makes a very good single sideband receiver um, i mentioned also in the presentation it has an iq mode that you can enable which then makes it act as a very uh, high performance 
front end, an RF front end, for an SDR application that you would run on a PC. So if you're running SDR software on a PC, you could then use that as you, as you would with any other um, RF front end, but very high performance and including the high performance 24-bit USB sound card as well, effectively, on the, on the device. And so, yeah, you can run uh, PC software uh, to demodulate any any mode. So you can use it as a general coverage receiver or an all-mode receiver uh, by doing that. Yeah, yeah. it's fa fabulous value and, and so small, as you said earlier as well. Got a couple of specific... Yeah, most people are shocked by that. They, they, they kind of... I had so many comments, you know, people received the package and they think there's some kind of mistake, whereas <laughs> how can the radio be in there? But it, it is, it's, it's a very tiny thing. Yeah, it's lovely to see the box available as well. I think when we bought our QCX, in fact, we had a club purchase on it, if you remember back then, we bought quite a lot. Yeah, And um, remember, but there yeah. weren't there wasn't the cases and things available then, although yeah. they were fairly basic, whereas this has really got a beautiful case for it, which I think yeah. for the money, to be honest, is, you'd be, unless you've and got that's, something And that's yourself. actually, um, that's why I did the... QCX Plus, um, which is my rather well, hacked up my personal mm. 20 meter QCX Plus. And so um, that really let us, uh, you know, I, I changed the QCX into the QCX Plus just mm. because it allowed me to make all that, all those mechanical problems I had regrets about with the original QCX, where the controls were at different heights and there was no easy way of putting it in enclosure. I was able to fix that with the uh, QCX Plus. And then the QCX Mini was the very small version, which I showed you earlier as well. Mm. And, and, and all just, of that, just for general, all of those beg your pardon. came out. So, sorry, just finish Go that quickly. Yes, all of please. those really came out of the same, you know, I made built relationships with the manufacturers of the cases for QDX at the end of 2019. And then I got to thinking, why don't I use um, the same manufacturer to make me cases for the QCX Plus and the QCX Mini? So it was kind of a reviving of the QCX as well that came out of the whole QDX project. Yes, I, mean, I was just going to ask, is the, for, for those watching who didn't know much about the QCX and never bought one, or maybe want to have a different version, you know, a new case, is that generally available at the moment, the QCX in the, in the new version? Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have both the QCX Plus and the QCX Mini in stock, in stock. Um, and I have 500 more enclosures uh, for the QCX Plus and the QCX Mini actually on the way with FedEx at the moment. Um, so they're in stock. I'm not ceasing the QCX at all. Um, I think that although SDR is clearly the future, I think there will always be a place for a single band sort of entry level all analog radio that's also very educational teaching the analog techniques and um, so I'm not planning on retiring QCX at all for a long time to come as long as I can still get the parts good um, so yeah they're both still in stock great thank you uh, I've got a question from Bob G6PWS who says is the 10 watt HFPA compatible usable with the QDX not really, because the HFPA has a driver stage as well as a power amplifier stage. So the 10 watt power amplifier was originally designed for the all mode, all HF QSX transceiver, which is still a working progress here. And that has a, it, you only need about 25 to 50 milliwatts to get a 10 watt output. Additionally, there isn't really that much point going from a 5 watts to a 10 watts RF output. It doesn't make that much difference. So and it, so it's not really compatible. What it is compatible with is the, I have this, you know, I have one here, but it's not very easy to get. Here we are. So I have this 50 watt power amplifier kit, um, which was designed for the QCX series rigs. And this rig, this amplifier has a, a five watt input here at this BNC and a 50 watt output here. And this is a single band amplifier, but it includes low pass filtering uh, here for one band. And it includes, again, one in 4007 pin diode switching. So it maintains a full QSK break in performance of the QCX. And this amplifier is compatible with the QDX, although you would want to run it at a lower duty cycle of operation. So you would want to run it probably not more than about 20 or 25 watts. Um, but the uh, PTT connector here is directly compatible 
with the TTT on the um, QDX. So it's a 3.5 millimeter uh, stereo uh, jack. jack yeah. So you could get a, a simple uh, audio cable. Yeah, I don't I haven't lived in UK for ages, but I used to be able to buy those in Poundland uh, with a 3.5 millimeter stereo plug on either end. And that's all you would need to connect between the two of them. But that would only be a single band um, solution as it stands because it's got this uh, low pass filter built in. Um, but, you know, people have been buying these and buying sets of filters and planning to do their own homebrew projects to set something up with multiple bands and so on. Um, so the 50 watt amplifier would be a better solution than the 10 watt linear. Um, and that, well, you know, that's also, that's got the heat sinks included in the kit. Um, it also has, by the way, which I can't show you here, it also has a matching enclosure, which is exactly the same profile as the QDX. So QDX, Q6 mini and the 50 watt power amplifier enclosure all have the same uh, profile. They just have different lengths and different mm. holes drilled in them. Um, so that 50 watt amplifier would be suitable for it if, if you feel the need for more power. Um, and if you're prepared to either do work to make it multiband or to use it on a single band. Thank you. That's brilliant. Um, I've got another question on the QDX. Uh, Mark G6 DDX says, I was lucky to get a QDX in batch one. Would really love to have one for six meters. Any chance? Yeah, I mean, it's something that I'm going to investigate. Six meters has challenges in so far as you probably need a pre-amplifier for it, an RF amplifier. Um, the One of the things I was looking into was trying to use a much more expensive, lower noise operational amplifier. Um, the one I'm using, the LM4562, has very low noise, uh, 2.7 nanovolt per square root hertz noise, uh, input noise but you can get even lower noise or at least you should be able to get even lower noise or amps but it, it turns out that at the moment you just can't source them at all and so that's something for the future so at the moment it, it would probably need a um, pre-amplifier an rf pre-amplifier ahead of it uh, to get the sensitivity that you need for six meter operation the multiplexer would be pretty much at the top end of its capability and there would be some inser insertion loss there through the uh, detector because of the high operating frequency the si 5351 a would be able to operate that frequency um, perfectly fine because that chip goes up to 200 megahertz so there'd be no issue there the um, power amplifier may well operate at lower efficiency uh, because the rise times and fall times would be a greater percentage of the cycle and so there may be lower power output on six meters. But what I'm going to do in the next firmware update, um, which is really the next thing on my to-do list now, is make it so that the bands are configurable on the QDX. So whereas at the moment it's just a single 80, 40, 30, 20 meter operation and the firmware will only operate on those bands and switches in the correct tap of the band pass filter or the correct low pass filters accordingly, what I'm going to do in the next firmware version is make it completely configurable. So if you wanted to experiment with other bands, um, including even six meters, you could do so. Um, but as I said, I think six meters will be a challenge to get the sensitivity you need. And you probably will end up wanting to have some kind of preamplifier ahead of the receiver. That's an RF preamp at the beginning of it. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, a question that I think you probably would have been asked many times when you're met in person at conventions and things. From a few people, uh, Malcolm G3PDH says, what happened to the multiband rig based on QCX technology, which I do remember you talking about before, because I was also going to ask you a similar question. And Bruce G4KZT says, Hans, any news about the QSX sideband kit? I'm very keen to get hold of one as soon as I can. So can you give us an yeah, update so on that long, long term project? These are actually the same question because you're both talking about yeah, the same thing. I thought so. And this yeah. was one of the questions I was also asked at the Q&A following my presentation in FDIM. It's a little bit of a sore topic and you should see the heaps of threats which I poured on that guy uh, at the FDIM, FDIM presentation. I declined to answer at FDIM. I said this is off topic for this, for this uh, uh, seminar, which is about QDX. And I offered to meet them all in the bar, anybody who wanted to know. 
uh, including the person pros posing the question uh, at the end of the night. And he actually didn't turn up, so he's probably afraid of what I was going to do to him. So but anyway, I'll answer it here because um, we probably have more time than we did at FDM anyway. Um, QSX was a very ambitious project from the start. Um, it was intended to be delivered to the uh, Yota 2018 summer camp in South Africa. And they did in build, indeed build a version of it, which was not completely functional. And it was my intention to then finish that in a few months following that when I got back. Um, I had some health issues then when I got back, um, which delayed that. Then I got involved with, uh, you know, I got distracted into a number of other projects. There was the ongoing overhead of running the business, um, which has just grown and grown every year um, and continues to grow every year despite the pandemic. Um, I have allowed myself to become distracted by other projects on the interim, such as the QDX, which is uh, one of the uh, one of the interim projects that I've done, and, and obviously the topic of this presentation this evening. And all of those things have taken time. They've all, all taken a lot more time than I ever thought they would, um, because I suffer from the um, underestimation of, of how long something's going to take, uh, as I'm sure many of us do. And so all of those things have taken time away from the QSX project um, and have also, uh, but have also, I think, contributed to it. So QDX, for example, shares much of the same code that is used in the QSX, uh, in the SDR, in the QSX. They're, they're based on basically the same modules. So in many ways, it puts into production something which is going to be in QSX in the end. The pin dyer switching and filtering, um, the ADC, and in fact, you know, the, the, the reason why I had 885 of the QDX was because there were originally 110 QSX produced for Yota in 2018, and I had originally purchased 1,000 of those ADC chips. So I had 890 left over, minus a few which fell between the floorboards of the SMD assembly machine, as always happens. And so I had enough left over to make 885 QDX. So it's the same ADC, it's the same um, code, the same microcontroller family. So a lot of the things I've been doing in the interim have been uh, steps towards the eventual delivery of QSX. But I readily admit it has taken me a very much longer time than I had hoped. Um, it's a much bigger project than I anticipated on uh, from the beginning. Uh, there's also been the issue of scope creep. Uh, so as soon as it was public knowledge that I was working on that project, uh, everybody started pouring in their suggestions. And of course, I thought those were good suggestions and the scope just enlarged and enlarged. Um, there's also, I think, the pressure that I have been under as a result of having announced that, that project has had a negative impact on my capability to deliver it because in many ways, I discovered long ago that if I'm, if if I don't really really feel like or not really passionate about working on a particular project, there's no point forcing myself at that point to do so. So it's a kind of burnout situation in some ways. Um, you become very very inefficient, uh, very low productivity, and that's basically what happened at some point with QSX and. Um, it, it became something that I had worked so intensively on leading up to Yota, and I was forcing myself to work on a few months afterwards that I kind of uh, became essentially sick of the project and took a break from it and then interrupted myself and other things. Um, there's also really huge challenges with finding the time to do R&D work. Um, when you've got thousands of customer emails. And the QCX continues to be a very popular product. We've sold in, in less than five years uh, almost 18,000 QCX series kits, as well as all the other stuff that goes along with that, like the 50-watt power amplifier, the enclosures, um, the continued firmware development for those, and the new versions, QCX Plus, QCX Mini. So it's a mixture. Why it's taken so long is a mixture of... Um, underestimating the time it would take me of getting burned out on the project because of all the time I spent on it, on all of the other distractions, on all of the time that is taken 
to run the business, particularly in these very hard times. But, you know, it certainly is not a project which has stopped at any point or a project that has ever left my mind at any point or has ever been given up on. It's a project that will happen. It's just a question of when it will happen. And because of the huge attention that there has been on it, it became even more important that it has to be done correctly. Um, and so all of those reasons have made it take a lot longer than I had ever hoped it would be. And my greatest mistake ever in this whole QRP Labs business, the time I've been running it, has been making that announcement public. And I did so at the time because I thought that I was uh, the, there was no point not doing so because I thought that you know I'd come back from Yota 2018 in South Africa and some of the kids would be putting photos on Instagram and Facebook and so on and there would be no point denying what we'd been doing. But in retrospect, I wish I had just kept totally silent about it and not said anything and uh, not not put myself under the pressure at least. And then at least I could have uh, continued working on it quietly in the background uh, when I had time. And that indeed is what I've done with QDX. You know, nobody knew, or at least a very, very small number of people uh, knew that I was working on QDX. Um, it was a surprise when I announced it uh, back in October. Uh, people just didn't know. And I think that's the best way to, to work on a project, really. Um, you lose the benefit of people making suggestions, but you also lose the pressure, the expectations, the questions. And um, so, you know, I, I prefer that I had not made that error, but um, I'm not repeating it. But yeah, basically the question is, it will come. It's just um, not entirely sure when. <laughs> Thank, Hans, you know what? I really, really respect. That is such an honest, completely honest answer. For those of you watching this, and if you're going to buy any of these products, considering it, if you go to Hans's website, he's kept that QSX on there. And it's very honest and candid uh, answer on there as well. And you've given us an even more honest answer here. And I'll, uh, I'll level with you as well. As most people know, who know me, you know that um, Tammy and I run a small electronics business. And I had exactly the same issue. I had a product which was announced in several variations. I had no, I'd done the first two, but I had, and I'd, I'd announced another six that would go with it. And we didn't do it for years. And it took about five years. And Tammy knows exactly what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter here, but and it's nice of you to be so honest. I was honest with people as well. And it just took years. And, and I went through a lot of the same emotions as you, by the way, losing yeah. interest in it, losing the passion for it. And then if you haven't got the passion for it, and you want it to be absolutely right. And that's what I always said, it must be good. And of course, the longer yeah. people wait, the bigger are the expectations. So I'm going to scrap the I question. Don't know, I don't I... know about you, David, but you know, I find in many ways creating a project is far more an artistic effort than it is an engineering or a technical effort. To me, when I create something like QDX, it's emotions, it's dreams, it's artistic, it's creativity. And then it becomes engineering to make it's, it into right. reality. And it's very, very hard if you feel burned out, if you feel pressure to be artistic. And uh, it, I, I, it's like writer's block or whatever. Yeah, the and, the, and the other problem is that making one of something on a bench and making yeah. it work is quite different when you have to build, push a button to make 100 or 500 or 1,000, yeah, which is yeah. the same for, for us in our business. And, and that can be very different. And the, it's the 10, 80, 10, 90%, 10 percent rule, isn't it? Yeah. The, the, yeah. the real, the, you know, the inspiration and the, the making it look good and everything for an exhibition is relatively easy sometimes because it's got all your passion and everything in it. But to actually yeah. turn that into a real product anyway. I won't go it's very, very tough. This is and, not about um, me, but I do share with that. I, I do yeah, empathise with you yeah, completely. It's not, <clears throat> it's, not the only, it's not the only people to suffer this. I mean, you look at what happened with Elecraft and their K4, for yes, example. Yes, absolutely. Same, and, yeah. um, it, it's a very, yeah, it, it's a very difficult. Plus, job. I mean, the added thing for you, I guess, and, you know, I'm not going to even ask. I'm gonna, I've scrubbed a question that I was going to ask you what's next, because I'm not going to ask you that. Um, <clears throat> as you would tell us if you'd have wanted to. Um, but but on the on the Q6 as well, of course, you're going to have all these same chip shortages problems and everything anyway. Yeah. 
So yeah. it, it is a mad world out there designing it products is. for it. So. Yeah, I mean, it has become even harder mm. now. To, it has become even yeah. harder now to finish because of that. Yes. Um, but yeah, we'll get there. I'm confident we'll get there in the end. Well, so thank you ever so much for um, such a candid answer on that. And, and that, is, that does end all of our, our questions <clears throat> from everybody at home as well. Lots of really wonderful comments for you. I can't read them all out. Um, uh, one that will make you smile and please, you know, Nev, M0, NFY says, I've just ordered one. So he's, I ordered one yesterday, he ordered one today. Um, and uh, Jim, I think, sums it up very well. Jim G through Wale says, superb talk, Hans. Have been so pleased with my QCX for many years, a great CW rig. Congratulations on a quality approach to radio. And I can't sum thank it up better, much. any better than that. So Hans, thank you ever so much. I know it's nearly quarter to midnight there, as far as I can work out, isn't it? Something like that, I think. So it's quite it is, late. It is, yeah, it is. And I know you're no a very problem. busy man, and I really appreciate you coming on tonight, especially when you're just recovering from COVID now. So I wish you speedy recovery with that. All the very best for your business. And please let us know when you've got another product which, you're, which you are happy to talk about, because we'd love to have you on yes. again. But once again, I thank you do. very much to Hans. Uh, G zero UPL. Thank you, Hans. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Thank you. There we are, and that's uh, it. Quite a late night, knife, nearly ten to ten. One of our longest running, but what a what an evening. Um, and uh, you know, I hope if you, especially if you're into the electronics, you'll really appreciate all of the detail that Hans went into there for this QDX, and it really sounds really innovative. And I'm not here to po push it, but I just say that I I spent my hard earned on it yesterday and I hope it's inspired some of you to give at least some construction things a go as well because you know we're very keen to encourage people to make stuff. But that's it for tonight's NARC Live. A reminder again, Sunday the GB Torres News at 7 o'clock on GB3 MB. On Monday the Monday Night Net at half past 7 on GB3 MB as well and at half past 8 the CW Net on 3.543 megahertz. And then next Wednesday, 8th of June, we won't be here on NARC Live. It'll be a meeting at the CNS school. Uh, and if you've got a nano VNA and don't know what to do with it, can't make it work, or you could have used it and you can come along and share that experience. Or if you're thinking of buying one, come along to that for an informal talk there. And also uh, the week after the tabletop sale on the 15th of June. And we'll see you back then on the 22nd of June for another NARC Live. But until then, from Tammy, MQ0TC. Like that? You've done it. I Great. Have. <laughs> and from me, uh, G, I've got to get this right, GQ7URP. Take care of yourselves. Have a good Jubilee break, and we look forward to seeing you, some of you at the club next week or in Nark Live in three weeks' time. Till then, bye bye. Bye bye.